Elmer Davis and his weekly war review. The Office of War Information presents its director, Elmer Davis, in the eighth of a series of weekly reports to the American people at home and to America's fighting forces overseas. Each week, Mr. Davis will summarize the progress of the war on the fighting fronts and will discuss home front problems closely related with the progress of the war. Elmer Davis and his weekly war review. But while the German armies are finding the going pretty tough, German propaganda won a striking success this week when it succeeded in bringing about a break in diplomatic relations between Russia and the Polish government in exile. The way the Nazis did it is a good example of the doctrine Hitler preached in Mein Kampf, that it's easier to make most people swallow a big lie than a little one. As you recall, when the Germans had beaten Poland in September of 39, the Russians moved in and occupied eastern Poland, taking thousands of Polish troops as prisoners. In June of 41, when the Germans attacked Russia, they overran all this territory that the Russians had occupied in Poland and have held it ever since. Now, almost two years later, they suddenly claim to have discovered near Smolensk the corpses of thousands of Polish officers who, according to the Nazis, were murdered by the Russians three years ago. In several respects, this story looks very fishy. At first, the Nazis were quite uncertain about the number killed. They said 10,000, then 2,000, then 5,000, before finally deciding on 12,000. Rome and Berlin disagreed as to how they had been killed. The Japs and the Vichy French got their signals crossed and were telling about Romanians murdered near Odessa, not Poles near Smolensk. The Russians were said to have tried hard to conceal the graves... Yet they buried every man in uniform with his identification tag, according to the German story. Suggestions of an investigation by the International Red Cross mean nothing, for the Germans control the area. It would be easy for them to show the investigators' corpses in uniform with identification tags. But there is no way the investigators could determine whether these men were killed by the Russians or by the Germans, as they probably were. The Nazis are known to have slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Poles after the fighting was over. If they found a camp full of Polish prisoners when they attacked Russia, it would have been the most natural thing in the world for the Germans to murder them too. If not at the moment, then later, when they needed corpses for propaganda exhibits. Remember that when the Germans invaded Poland, they told the world they had found the graves of thousands of German civilians massacred by the Poles. Few people ever believed that story, and it's all the more remarkable that any Poles who remember it should believe this one, especially as the motives of this one are so obvious. The first motive, of course, is to distract the attention of the world from the mass murders which the Germans have been steadily committing in Poland for three and a half years, murders by now so numerous that they look like a deliberate attempt to exterminate the Polish people. Another purpose would be to rouse suspicion and distrust between Russia and the rest of the United Nations, which would help the Germans in two ways. Directly, it might hamper the prosecution of the war that we are all fighting against Germany. Indirectly, it might help to prop up German morale at home. There's plenty of evidence that among the German civilian population, yes, and even in the army, there is less and less belief that they can ever win a decisive victory over all their enemies. But Nazi propaganda has persuaded many of them that any day now, America and Britain might call off the war, make a compromise peace, and leave Germany free to turn on Russia. And, of course, more Germans will believe that if there's trouble between Russia and any other of the United Nations. Yet this lurid murder story, which so plainly could do no good to anybody but the Germans, had serious consequences. For the Nazi propagandists were cleverly jabbing at a sore spot. The long-standing friction between Russia and Poland over the future frontier between those countries. This dispute is hundreds of years old. The Poles occupied much disputed territory after the War of 1920. The Russians moved back westward in 39. Two years later, the Germans pushed the Russians out. But statements by Russian leaders since have indicated that when they reconquer the territory they occupied in 1939, they mean to keep it. But the Poles insist on keeping it too, 
on retaining their country as it was before Hitler attacked them. To the outsider, it looks as if the time to settle this argument is after Germany is licked. For until Germany is licked, good and thoroughly, it won't make any difference where you draw that frontier line. That the situation has been permitted to get into the present tangle is no credit to either Polish or Russian statesmanship. General Sikorsky, head of the Polish government in exile, is an able and a reasonable man. But he is under constant pressure from a faction of extremists. The sort of men, void of any sense of political realities, who ruined Poland in the 18th century. But the reason these people were able to push Sikorsky's government into suggesting a Red Cross investigation of this fantastic murder story was that the Russians, for months past, had been completely unreceptive to any suggestions made by the Polish government for better and more humane treatment of Polish refugees in Russian territory. The Poles have now apparently withdrawn their suggestion of a Red Cross investigation. But when they made it, the Russians promptly broke relations with them in a note whose violent language is hard to explain. If Stalin means to go on dealing with the Poles at all, it's certainly poor policy for him to undermine Sikorsky, the most reasonable of Polish leaders. And if, as unconfirmed rumors have suggested, if the Russians should set up in Moscow a rival Polish government in exile composed of fellow travelers, That would do Hitler more good and Russia more harm than anything Nazi propagandists could ever think up. This has been treated by both Poles and Russians pretty much as a matter that concerns them alone. If it were finally to be settled on that basis, Russia's enormous preponderance in size would give the answer. But anything that creates division among the United Nations is the concern of every one of those nations, the United States included, because we must all hold together to win the war. After the war, if the United Nations continue to hold together in some sort of collective security system, there will be less danger that any of the great powers might feel that it had to safeguard its individual security at the expense of weaker nature, neighbors. That is the only way this Polish-Russian issue can be treated, as one phase of the problem of world security.